Welcome back to Turpentine VC, a podcast where we discuss the art and science of building successful venture firms, VC to VC. This is a fantastic conversation with Mike Maples and builds upon the narrative of seed venture that we've been sowing for the past few episodes, including episode four with Sam Lesson of Slow Ventures and episode six with Chad Byers of Susa. Mike is, of course, a co-founder of Floodgate, a storied seed firm that's invested in Lyft, Twitch, and Twitter. In this episode, Mike and I dive into why it's so important to force a choice and not a comparison when differentiating, why discipline and patience are a form of arbitrage, and ultimately why they've shifted their strategy to predicting who the next great founders will be. If you like what you hear, please do subscribe and leave us a review. Now on to the interview. Mike, welcome to the podcast. It's great to chat with you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Mike, so you at Floodgate have done phenomenally well. Uh, you guys have done Lyft and, and Okta and uh, Twitch and Twitter and a number of other winners where we're lucky to be both Applied Intuition and, and, and Rappy together. Um, I want you to trace the history of Floodgate a little bit, kind of fun to fund, maybe to talk about kind of the biggest inflection points in, in Floodgate's history. Yeah. So, um, you know, a couple of these things uh, I was doing right only in hindsight, not really understanding at the time. Uh, and, and so I like to say that one of the tricks to startups is uh, living in the future and seeing what's missing. And, and so I'm a big believer in that saying by William Gibson, the future is already here. It's not evenly distributed. And so I was out here. I just moved here from Austin to, to Silicon Valley. And um, I was hanging out at two firms, Foundation Capital and August Capital. And I just saw time and again, founders were trying to start their companies for much less money than they had in the past. The way companies were being built was changing with the LAMP stack and open, you know, open source software and, and soon to be Amazon Web Services. And so, you know, it was just, I was, I was noticing that founders couldn't raise a million dollars in Silicon Valley. They had to raise 250,000 from angels, or they had to go straight to a $5 million series A. That seems impossible to believe in today's world where you have like more, you know, if you type in angel investor in LinkedIn, there's more angel investors and seed investors than there are founders, I think. But like, you know, in 2000 seed firms and all that stuff, but that wasn't true in 2005. And so, you know, it was, it was, um, trying to solve a problem that the entrepreneurs kept saying they were having, which was, you know, I can't raise just a million dollars and that's what I want to do. And so that's how we got started. Uh, just, you know, I, I like to say at the time 500,000 is the new 5 million. And that was the, that was kind of the, the founding premise. Well, one of your principles is, uh, you know, don't be the best to be the only and, you know, force a choice, not a comparison. And so what happens is you had this early insight, but then a ton of other firms came behind you and, and also, you know, followed that. So, so Trace, what then happened from there in terms of how you're thinking about ev evolving the firm? Sure. Uh, and, and I guess the first thing that's probably useful to do is just to clarify what I mean by forcing a choice and not a comparison. So in life, I think, um, so business is never a fair fight. The only question is who gets to fight unfair. And when you're an upstart, the default option is the incumbent gets to fight unfair. The incumbent has the advantages of incumbency. And so the only way that an upstart can behave unfairly is to change the subject, you know, is to deny the premise of the current rules. And so when I talk to founders, that's why I say force a choice and not a comparison. Like when people took a lift ride, they didn't say, oh yeah, but how does that compare to taxis? And, uh, and, and so you want it, that's what you really want, right? Um, you, you know, Blake Scholl's now doing boom supersonic. Nobody's going to say, oh, well, how does that compare with like normal jet travel? You know, it's like, you can't compare the two. And so when you're a startup, you want to offer something that is so radically different that it literally breaks the pattern of how people are currently doing things. And, and you want to have something that can't be reconciled with what's come before it, right? So like when we were in the early days of Floodgate, nobody said, oh, well, how does that compare to Sand Hill Road? It was like, we're, we're writing $500,000 checks. The other guy's writing $5 million checks. There was us and just a few other guys, right? Maybe Steve Anderson and, you know, a few other people, Josh Koppelman. But like none of us had enough money to do all the deals we wanted to do. And so more often than not, we, you know, we decided to collaborate out of necessity. 
uh, rather than the other way around. If you know, if I saw something I want to do, the first thing I did is I called Josh or Steve, sometimes both. Uh, and so the next thing you know, to your point, Eric, there's like thousands of seed firms. And so I found myself in this funny position of, am I a hypocrite now? Because I am playing the comparison game. And uh, why, why, you know, under what basis am I, am I able to say to a founder, don't play the comparison game, and now I'm being compared in every deal I do. So I decided to shift the strategy. And I mean, we're, we're involved with a company together, applied intuition is a good example of the strategy. So I decided I was going to try to predict who's going to be a great founder someday and get to know that person before they have a startup. So with uh, applied intuition, I've spent 14 months on and off with Castor Yunus before we wrote a check. And why am I doing that? Well, by the time they decide they want to start a startup, I want to say, hey, look, we know each other. We know what it's like to work together. We know whether we want to get in trouble together or not. So here's my question to you. Do you want to do something? Yes or no? And if we want to do something, if we want to work together, let's find a deal that's fair. It'll be higher price than I want, lower price than you want. But like, life is too short. And if you go pitch 10 other firms, you might get a better deal, but like, you're not going to know these people for more than two hours and you just can't reconcile that. You can't reconcile the choice between us working together and you taking the best deal from somebody you meet for two hours. And so like, that's, that's how I decided to do it. But like, I believe fundamentally that, um, particularly since we've decided to be small and not raise giant funds, you must force a choice. You must. And if you don't force a choice and if, if you play the comparison game, you can do well, but you'll only do well relative to the average. You know, it's only a question of how much better than the average slightly do you do. It's kind of like index investing, right? If you do what other people do, you're going to, you're never going to seriously outperform. You'll only slightly outperform at, at best. And, and so the way you force a choice is, is going earlier, which, which we'll go deeper on. But just to also talk about the counterfactual. You guys, you know, have done very well. So you could have raised any, any kind of amount you wanted. You could have also forced a choice in the way that some others did, perhaps by going much bigger um, and, and becoming multi-stage and, you know, really investing in, in sort of all these services, the way A16Z had, we had Ben Horowitz on, on the show. Um, to talk about what are the, like, why didn't you take that path or what are other op ways in which you considered, you know, potentially forcing a choice besides going earlier? Um. You know, that was the only way I ever figured out that I thought I could actually succeed at. Uh, and so I think part of, part of forcing a choice and not a comparison and part of entrepreneurship is knowing how to show up in the world as your best self. And it's very tempting to try to define yourself relative to the others. And what I find is that there's only one you. And so if you're your best self, you become hard to compete against. And so, um, you know, that means that Floodgate's never going to have a big team. We're going to always have a really small team. And that means that we're going to take it really seriously when we add a partner, right? So like, um, Ann and I've been working together 15 years. Iris joined over 10 years ago. Arjun is like our new, new early timer partner. And he, he's been here for eight years. And so like, um, we, you, our model only works if you keep your funds small and if you have a team that really trusts each other and, uh, you know, to me, it, once you get big, you have to scale and you have to start having processes and, and you can succeed, but you're going to succeed more in the way that uh, an index fund succeeds, right? You're going to, you know, if I'm a sovereign wealth fund and I've got tons of money to invest, I'm okay if you're slightly better than average because I, I need to put money to work in these big investment vehicles. Um, but that's not what we're really interested in. We're, you know, and sometimes we take risks that, that fail and will underperform. But like we believe fundamentally that uh, we want to be a very small team of a highly differentiated set of people pursuing a highly differentiated strategy uh, and, and, and one that reflects who we are as people rather than, you know, oh, Sequoia is doing this. We should do this. Oh, a 16 Z is doing that. YC is doing that. Right. To me, the answer has to be no matter what, don't do what they do. Right. Like doing what they do is, is going to be wrong almost no matter how good they are. Uh, you know, being different and worse sometimes is better than being the same and trying to be better at being the same. Competition is for losers, as uh, you know, as as Peter Thiel says. Well, to that point, you know, 
yes, when firms raise, you know, billions or tens of billions, their, their return profile doesn't have to be as high if they're raising from sovereign wealth funds, et cetera, or, or isn't expected to be and, and, and won't be. I'm curious what you think about firms kind of in the uncanny valley, you know, between like 500 million and a billion dollar funds, you know, they're not, they're not A6Z, they're not th these massive funds, but they, but they are really big. I, I, I don't want to name, name names, but I'm, I'm curious if you think, man, that they're in a tough spot or, or it's unclear what the, what the LP product is and necessarily because they, they probably do have higher expectations. Um, and it's going to be hard to return that, that amount of capital to your, to your point, the strategy only works if, if your funds are small. What do you think about that? Uh, you know, to, uh, I'm a little embarrassed to say, to be honest, I don't really think about it that much. Uh, and so like, to me, the only thing that matters about thinking about other firms is how it affects the perception of the founder. And so like, like what I've learned is that the best way to succeed in doing something different is to provide differential value to the founder. And, and so the, 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 the path to the light is always what are founders not getting that they would find valuable. And, and, and usually I find that if I spin my wheels, it, it's because I'm overly focused on what, what my peers and competitors and other folks are doing, right? Um, finding a differential, valuable thing that entrepreneurs care about always ends up being a good answer. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Turpentine VC is proudly sponsored by Synaptic. Are you investor looking to make better investment decisions? You'll know that the quality of your decisions is determined by the quality of your data. A recent survey shows that 99% of VCs don't have a coherent data strategy. Our friends at Synaptic can provide you the data you need to join the 1% of VCs who do. Synaptic unifies over 100 real-time company performance metrics across alternative data sets like user traffic, employee data, app downloads, product reviews, and more. It's your all-in-one source for alternative data that helps you make better investment decisions. Synaptic are trusted by Ribbit, Felicis, Valor, GIC, and more top investors. To learn how Synaptic can improve your sourcing, tracking, and due diligence, visit synaptic.com slash turpentine, or click the link in the show notes. That's synaptic.com slash turpentine. Yours was you went pre-company, and you know, ha having started on deck, I, I'm definitely a uh, resonator inspired by, by a similar idea. And so when it comes to pre-company, you, you think about the people and you think about idea. And I, I know you've, you've studied and, and written about both. Let, let's maybe first talk about the people. Kasser, you know, an incredible entrepreneur, um, you know, a bit more seasoned, but you're also working with people perhaps less seasoned. I know you've read about different basketball coaches or other sort of amazing identifiers of talent. What have you learned or what have you taken um, as you've considered, you know, how, how to bet on people or evaluate people before they have a company? Yeah. So, so, um, it's interesting. There's this term that I like, uh, recently I call it, uh, pattern breakers and, and, um, you know, people say that VCs are about pattern matching and I actually kind of reject that. Right. So like, actually, I think good venture capital is about understanding where the pattern is about to be broken. So humans, right. Hu we are pattern seeking creatures. You know, we brush our teeth every day. We drive to work the same way. And for the most part, behaving according to a pattern enhances our survival. It helps us fit in the social hierarchy. It helps us, you know, it helps us run away from saber tooth tigers when they, you know, were coming after us, stuff like that. But like in startups, you know, back to this premise that it's never a fair fight, a startup has to engage in activities that break the patterns that they have to do two things. They have to have an idea that's pattern breaking that defies the norms that changes the rules. But then the, the, the founders themselves have to engage in pattern breaking behaviors, which kind of gets to your question. So, um, for example, Justin Kahn, when he pitched me on, uh, Justin TV at the time, which was a terrible idea. Um, I, I remember thinking this is a terrible idea, but I like this guy and I like the technology they're building. And then that night when I was studying it some more, they had sold their prior company, Kiko, which was a calendar company. They'd sold it on eBay. And I was like, who does that? And I was like, you know, these are the kinds of guys that win because they're, you know, pattern breakers engage in behaviors and activities that conventional people wouldn't normally engage in. You know, in hindsight, one of the foolish things that I did was passing on a startup called Airbed and Breakfast before it applied to YC. And, and you know, Brian Chesky, when he pitched me, there's a box or a room full of cereal boxes, Obama O's and Captain McCain crying and like. Looking back on it, that was much more of a feature than a bug because it, it showed 
that he was willing to do unconventional things to get unconventional results. And so that's a lot of what I look for. And, and when I'm talking to founders or prospective founders, I'm trying to understand what are the, what are the types of things that they're wildly interested just for their own sake? What are projects they've done in their lifetime that they did just because, you know, what are things that they've done that didn't uh, improve their status or the dominance hierarchy, but rather uh, were just like things that they did for their own sake, for their own independent reasons. And so, you know, that, that's been a, an important indicator for me a lot of times. Fascinating. One challenge with pattern breakers is they don't always reference amazingly, right? Because sometimes they're tr troublemakers uh, at the, their previous em employee, or maybe they're just not good employees. And so I'm curious when you're doing founder references and you're trying to determine, is this the good kind of bad reference or the bad kind of, uh, you know, not great reference? H how do you disentangle? Yeah, well, the first thing I I've, I would say is I think I've learned a lot about reference checking from uh, Matt Mashari, who's kind of this famous coach. And uh, I, I was lucky enough to work with him a little bit. And one of the things that Matt recommends is, let's say you're looking at somebody's resume. You ask them while you're interviewing them, okay, who was your manager in that situation? What was their name? What did you learn from them? And then at the inter end of the interview, Rather than say, hey, can I have some references? You say, that list of names right there, can I talk to those people? And, and so, like, so like a lot of people make the mistake of thinking, well, I'm going to get an indirect reference. And that's going to be good because now I'm going to find the scuttlebutt about who they really are. But the problem with that is that indirect reference may not have actually worked with that person. Or they may not really know what that person's assets and liabilities are. Whereas... If, if somebody worked directly for you, you're in a pretty good position to objectively say what their assets and liabilities are. And so, you know, now I, they, they may still get a bad reference, but, but I'm not as interested. I don't say to the person, hey, d do you recommend this person? I'm more like, okay, tell me the circumstances where you think they were excellent. Tell me the ones where they're not. What are their superpowers? What are their Achilles heels? You know, that kind of stuff. So you're trying to, you're trying to get their balance sheet. Rather, you know, what are their assets and liabilities rather than just an absolute answer, I think. Uh, and it's up to you to decide, right? Is this, is this the type of person who's going to move the world to a different future? And uh, that's, a, that's a different job description than were they a good employee at your company. Yeah, totally. W while we're on the topic of, of references, um, let's switch the, the lens to the VCLP world. When, when you know, we're going to talk about sort of advice for emerging managers and, and they're trying to raise for LPs and LPs do a ton of references, right? You know, more than VCs usually do. W what do you think is most important for v uh, emerging managers to take in mind about how they should think about what they want to reference well as? Or when you're referencing, let's say you were on the LP side and referencing emerging managers, what are the, the biggest questions you would be asking? Yeah, well, if, I think if I was a, a, an LP, uh, I would be asking questions that relate to uh, whether whether the person has an original approach to investing that I think is compelling. Uh, I think that that um, sometimes the LPs are looking for people that appear conventionally successful, and um, it, that doesn't always work out. But it, but if I zoom way out. The, the thing I would recommend to most GPs, because I like I, I I don't know if I would succeed as an LP, right? Um, the the mistake I see most GPs make is they treat fundraising like it's a sales cycle. So they they say, okay, there's a bunch of LPs out there. There's a funnel. Uh, I'm going to pitch them, and I'm going to try to anticipate their objections and try to you know overcome the objections and get them to invest in my firm. And what I've kind of come to believe is that. LPs decide very quickly whether they want to be in business with you. And um, if you have to persuade them beyond what they've already decided, that it's a fool's errand. And so, and why is that? It's the same reason that, that, that I say to founders, people are animated by belief. And, and the, the, the reason I found that whatever success we've had with LPs, it's because they believed what we believed. And it wasn't because I looked at it like, how am I going to pitch this person? I was just like, here's what we are. And like, you either believe it or you don't believe it, but, but I'm not going to change what it is. Right. And, you know, we're going to make mistakes and we're going to do some things well, but like, we're not going to be a seed fund, this fund and not a seed fund in the next fund. Sometimes I think my tagline should be seed investing, dot, 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 really, 
because I have to re-remind people over and over again that that's still what we do after 15 years. Uh, but, but I, I, but I guess I think that like all you can be is your best self. And, um, I think that there's a certain set of LPs that'll resonate with that. And there's a certain set that won't, but like try to convince the people who don't, I think is a waste of time. I think what you should do is be clear about what you are. So the people who are prepared to believe what you believe understand clearly what they should believe in. And, um, you know, so I always like to say that by the time you start fundraising, you should know who's ready to do this, because if you have to build new relationships to raise money, that that's not a strategy I would recommend. I don't think that's a good idea. So you guys are institutional seed firm and you have been for a long time. Uh, Multi-stage has, has, has firms have gotten into seed, you know, pushing prices upwards. And so you've had to make a decision. Hey, do you do you play at higher prices or do you? find things that other people aren't willing to do and play at lower prices, but it's, you know, much more contrarian bets. Is, is that a fair su summary of the, of the sort of fork in the road that you've had to deal with as sort of, um, venture has evolved and, and what have you chosen? Yeah, I think that's right. So I think that, that, uh, what we find is that, um, the multi-stage firms have been doing a lot of seed investing and they've definitely driven up prices. And for the most part, I think that seed firms can't make money by playing that game. Uh, I, I, I actually think that the multi-stage firms aren't going to either, but that's a whole other discussion. Uh, I think that a lot of this has been very FOMO based and, and also kind of based on people wanting to have something to talk about other than the high price portfolio companies that aren't working out so well. So like, why do I think that is? Well, let me take a couple of examples. So Ann invested in a company called Lyft at a five and a half million dollar post money valuation and made 200 X on that. We invested in another company, a great company, great CEO founder, uh, Zamran. And we invested in that with CRV, a good multi-stage firm. And I think we did uh, a $4 million check at 30 post. They had a, go a good exit, like 450 million. We made, I think six times our money. I mean, six times ain't bad, but, but it ain't 200 X. You can't live in a world where the occasional home run is 6X, right? Like not as a seed fund, you can't, right? And so the, the, the thing that people don't understand in seed is that price and risk have a one-to-one -one correlation, right? Like if, if, if I can invest at five posts, I can afford to take six times the risk than if I invest at 30 posts uh, for the same expected return profile. And so for me to invest at 30 posts, the amount of de-risking that needs to occur and the amount of extra money that I need to put in starts to turn it into asymptotically a series A round, right? And, and, and last time I looked, that's not our business. And so, so I think that's the problem. Uh, and so what I'm also seeing with the multi-stage firms is their junior people are doing the deals. And so the natural thing for a junior person to do is to go look at a bunch of sexy companies, find the chief product officer, they peel out of that company and they automatically won the credentialing game and they, they're raising it 25 to 30 posts, don't even have a slide deck yet in some cases. And so I'm, I just look at that. I'm like, okay, that's where a lot of these uh, multi-stage funds are deploying their seed capital. I just think that's a bad business. And even, even in the case where it's good, it's already priced to perfection. You're already, you're already playing a consensus game. So even if you're right, you're consensus and right rather than non-consensus and right. And so, you know, at best, you're going to perform slightly better than the average rather than be a super. Performer. So we've have to, had to find ways to find um, opportunities that are not, not going to be immediately chased by the multi-stage firms. And, and fortunately, there's plenty of those. Yeah, I, I think the one outlier who's been able to been, be consensus and still make a bunch of money is, is, is YC because, because of the scale that they've been able to um, operate at, they can take a, a, a lot of bets, but they get special economics. And so even if they have a very high loss rate, um, they, they will still make, uh, you know, good money. And, and, you know, that's, uh, Warren, um, Buffett says, uh, you know, franchise is a business where you can replace everybody with new people and, um, the business is still strong. And, uh, I think, you know, YC is probably the cl closest thing to it. What they're doing that's non-consensus is their economics. So, so to me, a lot of people confuse non-consensus with contrarianism. 
And the contrarianism is another form of conformity because you're still defining yourself relative to somebody else. Um, Non-consensus means just I'm not the consensus. And like YC is not the consensus because they're getting economics in a deal that nobody else gets. So they're getting something nobody else is getting. They're doing something nobody else is doing. So to me, like super performance always comes from thinking and acting in ways that other people don't think and act, right? That there, there's no way to outperform the average unless you do that. And by the way, every time you do that, you risk failing. You risk underperforming the average because you're just wrong. But like that's to me, that's the magic of YC is they're able they're able to act differently than others. And they've they've established their economics as reasonable to founders. Yeah. Another way of getting special economics is uh, is is incubation, doing things like what, what Atomic and, and others do, where they provide capital and idea support and and other kinds of support and, and get special economics in exchange. And given that you're playing at the pre-company stage in, in, in some cases, and, and you have a curriculum about, uh, you know, a lot of thinking around idea generation and you have the capital, is, is, is incubation something that you, you might do? Or how do you think about that? I, I think it's something we might do. Uh, the, the reason we haven't done it so far is that I think most people who do incubations have no idea what they're getting themselves into, right? So you have a VC plotting missile trajectories on a whiteboard, thinking that they're a, a co-founder of something. And they, they just have no idea how you have to will that sucker into existence, right? So, you know, guys like Mike Spicer have been incredibly disciplined and focused. So, so like, okay, how can incubation succeed? I think it's not a model or a process. I think it has to flow from the person involved. In, you know, Idea Lab worked when Bill Gross had good ideas. Atomic works because Jack Abraham has good ideas. What, what Sutter Hill does works because of Mike Spicer and how he approaches things. But like not anybody can just take the Mike Spicer playbook or the Jack Abraham playbook or the Bill Gross playbook. It's very situational to them. And by the way, other people have done this well too. Founders Fund with Anderol and uh, Palantir. But like even in those cases, it was, it flowed from the idiosyncratic differences of what was compelling about the founder, right? Trey Stevens understood the government, he understood defense. Uh, Joe Lonsdale and Peter Thiel had done a bunch of work understanding what was going on in the, in the government with um, CIA and SSA. Um, I think that the Thrive folks have done a, a really good job. But like Kareem is like, he, he came from a medical background, right? That was his life. And so, so I think that, that if we were going to do incubations, we would need to have specific individuals that you could build a strategy around. Uh, and, and, and I think that's the only way we would do it. And I, I wouldn't rule it out, but like, what I'm not going to do is get myself into something that, you know, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Totally. And, and when the, the casters of the world come to you pre, pre company, pre idea even, and are sort of batting, like, do you have a, a ideas that you're giving out to people or you're more, are you more of an editor, um, or using your frameworks to help identify what was a good idea or how do you help there? Yeah. So I have a set of things that I like to call stress tests. So, you know, I would say to somebody, um, look, it's not my job to have an idea, but what I can do is I can, I can help you do two things. I can help you rule out ideas that sound plausibly good, but that aren't that good. So like a good friend of mine, Sarah Leary, right before she started next door with Nirov, they started, a uh, uh, fan base and fan base was a social network for sports fans. That's a great example of a plausibly good sounding bad idea because like anybody you talk to about, Hey, social network for sports fans will say, Hmm, that makes sense. But the problem is nobody was desperate to have one of those. So you had zero desperate people and a bunch of people who thought it was plausibly good. Those are the ideas that kill you. Uh, and those are the, the ideas you're most likely to have because they're, they're plausibly good sounding. And so part of our stress tests are designed to eliminate those ideas. And then there's another set of ideas like Justin TV, a terrible idea, but it was actually worth pursuing because it embodied some foundational elements that made it interesting. And so one stress test that we have is something that we call the inflections stress test. Another one we have is the insights stress test. Another we have is the implementation prototype stress test, but we we have all these things and they're, they're, what we're trying to do is help the founder get confident that this idea has explosive potential 
before they cross that Rubicon and raise money. Because once you raise money, you hire people, you start building your MVP. You have to believe even when you don't believe, right? You, you, like you, you, you just get committed to this thing in, in very subtle ways. And so how do we stress test it before we commit ourselves? How do we try to falsify the idea before we go unbelievably all in on the idea? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating because yeah, YC gives you 500K and um, you know, usually when you have 500K, you're probably not gonna you know, wind down the company in a few months, but you may not have had the right idea. So you end up you know, committing to like a two year journey or at least, or, you know, um, when it, that's in the case of failure, um, when you get 500 K, whereas if you don't take the money and you can go through a more sober, detached ideation space, maybe you can save yourself the, the time from prematurely agreeing to the, to the wrong idea. Yeah. And it's interesting. We have this thing called reactor. That's almost the opposite. My, my colleague and Mira Co runs it. And we find people who are like, um, you know, early twenties, uh, usually amazing builders. And we say to them, look, our default assumption is you're not going to drop out of school, that you're not going to pursue this idea. But like, wouldn't you like to be put in a set of circumstances where you can try, but like, this is not, we're not going to have a demo day. We're not going to put you in front of investors. Like, because you want to cross that Rubicon when you know, when you know this has a potential to be your life's work, if it works. And, uh, you know, the idea is just because you can raise money doesn't mean you should, because the only real failure is to be three years into a startup you wish you weren't in any. And because the only thing you can't get back is your time. And so it's a little bit of a different philosophical approach, right? But like, we actually don't believe that innovation's random. We don't believe that you throw a bunch of ideas against the wall. We believe that founders who are great have a determined idea of a different future and they pursue it with reckless abandon. And, and that, that those are the people who have the, the massive outcomes. And, you know, YC has, with these giant batches, probabilistically, you're going to have some people who do that. But we can't, we don't, we don't have 250 folks in a batch. We have to, you know, I'd be surprised if we make seven or eight investments this whole year. And so, you know, we don't, we just, it's just a different model. Speaking of investing now, you, you started uh, Floodgate sort of a, around the rise of mobile and you, you, you know, greatly, uh, you know, participate in that with Twitter and, and Lyft and, and, and others. Now we're at the rise of a new platform where the rise of, of AI. And, and so how, how are you thinking about, um, you know, what that means for venture capital at large and how, how, it, what it means for you as an investor? Yeah. So, th so I'm looking at it from a couple of angles and, and, you know, I guess I'm a little bit of a history buff, um, and you got to be careful about that stuff, but like the first thing has to do with risk. And so when I was an entrepreneur before the dot-com stuff, VC was meant to fund technical risk takeout. And so the theory was that, Hey, if I'm building a router, that's 10 times faster than the other guy's router, there's no market risk. Like people will want a 10 times faster router because no router is fast enough. And so in the early days of computing, people would pay for more performance because computers didn't perform that well at first. So um, what you learn, though, is that market risk and technical risk have an inverse relationship, right? So like if I have a cure for cancer, there's no market risk. The, the hard part is coming up with a cure for cancer. But if I overcome that technical risk hurdle, I can sell as much of this as I want, right? Um, conversely, if I'm building a product that anybody can build, the winner is the first guy to get product market fit. Nothing else matters. And so what, what I understood when I was starting Floodgate was that the relative importance of market risk and technical risk flip-flopped in a world of lean startups. In a world of lean startups, Kevin Rose could start Dig for $1,500 over a weekend. And so the question was not, can you build the thing? The question was, who's going to get product market fit before everybody else? And so now what you were funding was not technical risk takeout, you were funding market adoption risk takeout. And what, what we succeeded at was funding these companies uh, early, right as they were about to take out market adoption risk. And then once they did, their valuations went up exponentially because now all of a sudden the, the bigger firms could fund expansion and trying to take over these global markets. YC took a different approach there were three approaches to it. YC was the second approach and it was brilliant. YC basically said, okay, well, if it doesn't cost much to fund startups, let's just fund a whole bunch of them. And, uh, you know, we don't have to be pickers. We could just like, 
it, we can, it, it, option value is kind of a, a Taleb thought, right? The asymmetric upside kind of, um, kind of model. And then the third people who really capitalized well, in my opinion, were benchmark. And so what Peter Fenton understood was that when market adoption risk gets taken out at a certain level, you can pay a higher price than most people realize. And so he would, he would pay up for companies that had overtly taken out market risk. But he was better at figuring out who'd taken out market risk than most people were. So a lot of people were paying up for companies that had not taken out market risk. But Fenton understood, hey, I can, I can let YC, I can let Floodgate be the first guys on Omaha Beach. And then I can figure out how the, how the stage is settling if I, if I get good at understanding what real adoption is versus is not. And so, you know, you look at Peter Fenton, Matt Kohler, that Fab Four team of benchmark became experts at doing that over and over again very well. Why does this matter for AI? I noticed that AI, on one hand, there's some projects that have very high technical risk where they're raising $100 million plus rounds and they're trying to, that only works if the AI problem that you're solving is important to humanity and there's no other way to solve it other than AI. That's like te technical risk on steroids. But then I'm seeing market risk on steroids. You know, these models come out at a dizzying rate and, uh, you know, one company comes out that looks hot and then it's obsolete the next week. And so you have a market risk on steroids. And so what the way I internalize that is it's hard for me to write $100 million checks um, for the ones that are trying to take out market risk. I have to find opportunities that are distribution led because if the, if the founder doesn't have a good answer for how am I going to get distribution compared to everybody else? It, it, it's, it's your guess is as good as mine as to whether they're going to pull this off. Um, because it's very hard to know what's going to emerge or who else is going to be there. The only thing you know for sure is that there will be a lot of competitors. So that's one part of it. The other part though, historically is, um, early days of the internet, right? So in the early days of the internet, it was really hard to know how these companies would make money. It was, it was clear that the internet was wildly empowering. Everybody was excited. Same with AI. But you looked at a lot of these companies and you're like, all the benefits are going to the consumer, not to the, not to the provider. But then pretty soon Yahoo started to make money with ads. eBay started to make money with auctions, Amazon with e-commerce. Nobody asks anymore, how's, how's anybody going to make money on the internet? I think the same will happen with AI. We'll start to see the emergence of different kinds of business models that it, it'll, it'll be obvious in hindsight. But right now that we're kind of this mode where it's a little bit unclear. And, you know, if, if you were investing in the internet in like 95 and 96, you needed to exercise real care in the investments that you did because most of them just went to zero. You know, most of them were companies that we never even heard of anymore because it just didn't matter. And so a lot of the AI investments will be that way, I think. When you started Floodgate, you mentioned you started with the insight, hey, you, you know, you need 500K, not, not 5 million, et cetera. The, the, the risk has shifted. Let's say you were starting Floodgate in 2023, and this goes back to your advice for emerging managers, which is have a, you know, have a thesis. If you were starting it today, what would your differentiating thesis or approach be? Yeah, and it's interesting um, because like we, we ask that all the time, right? Like, so, you know, in the, in the 2010s, I started to realize, okay, well, if we just do what we've been doing, we're going to be average. And so um, we, we have to ask, why does the world need Floodgate? you know, when there's 2000 seed funds, why, why are we relevant at all? And my conclusion was that we could find founders before they started their startup so we could help them. You know, like, I think greatness starts early, you know, just like the United States had a good constitution and a good founding sort of framing set of principles, uh, beginnings matter. And so, you know, we wanted to find these founders before they started and help them begin better. We don't just say, here's a check, you're a witch doctor, get product market fit, let us know when you need more money and you want to scale. We don't come up with the idea for the founder, but we have a lot of first principles thinking that helps them come up with a better kind of formation setup in the same way that the United States did. So that's what we've decided to do. But no matter, no matter what your strategy is, you, you've got to be able to articulate what your advantage is and why you are absolutely one of a kind on the tip of your tongue, or you're just doing it because you think it's fun, not because you're going to make money for people. Totally. And that's, that's what I would tell seed fund managers. And it could be a lot of things, right? Like, um, you know, we talked about applied intuition. Maybe there's a way that I can know more about certain things because of that vantage point. 
and I can make investments that harness that knowledge. But it's like, you got to know where you're fighting an unfair fight at all times, because if it's, if you're not fighting an unfair fight to your advantage, you're fighting an unfair losing fight where somebody else has the advantage. Yep. So you're, you're kind of acting horizontally or you're, you're a generalist firm with a specific, you know, stage where you, you like to add a ton of value. You know, there's this broader question. Andreessen has kind of specialist funds, uh, you know, Kleiner, Felice, who we also had on are, you know, much more generalist, uh, in terms of, how, you know, the types of people they hire and how they operate. Do you think the world is moving in a, or the venture world is moving in a more specialized direction or will generalists continue to flourish? Well, I guess I feel like in general, the venture industry is getting increasingly more of an efficient market. And, and that's true, whether you're a specialist or a generalist. And so you can make money either way, right? Like, like, for example, I would say Roger Ehrenberg at IA Ventures was a specialist. I'd say that Mike Spicer at Sutter Hill has been a specialist. Like you always know what a Roger Ehrenberg deal was going to look like. And you always know what a Mike Spicer deal is going to look like. But, you know, not many people are disciplined enough to do the thing they do extremely well over and over again. Uh, that takes a lot of discipline. And, you know, discipline and patience are a form of arbitrage, right? For sure. And then the generalists, you know, can have advantages as well. They might have a better platform. They might have a good brand. There's a whole set of different things you got to work on. Uh, you know, generalists have the advantage of not getting attached to an area where if it's not paying off anymore, they can't move to a different area. But, but in all cases, I think that the thing that people always have to ask is where's their inefficiency that plays to my advantage and what, what can I do that other people can't, uh, to exploit that advantage. And if you don't have an answer to that question, the tendency is to invest still because you're like, I've got to be in the game and my LPs expect me to invest. But I would say no, that if you don't have an answer to that question, you got no business investing LP money that you're just, you know, you're just doing investing rather than really investing. And so for all the emerging managers out there, it's, um, yeah, they have to figure out where they differentiate and perhaps it's, they have some expertise in some sector. Perhaps they have some sort of special network access. Perhaps they have a belief on what kind of stage they want to play at similar to you in terms of you know, maybe pre-company or, you know, bullpen plays kind of at the intersection of, of you know, the, the, they've coined the post seed, um, where they think there's, there's a unique sort of capital deployment opportunity. And so you just have to have some thesis on, on something that, that will give you differentiated edge. Yeah. And I think that the other, the other dichotomy you could have drawn a difference between is like small team versus big team scalable. And, um, like, uh, one person that I really miss and just had huge respect and admiration for was Dave Swenson at Yale. Right. And I mean, getting to know him was just an opportunity of a lifetime. And, uh, he used to have this term that I really liked. Um, you want to have a portfolio that is uncomfortably idiosyncratic. And so his view was that a lot of firms, they become too institutional. They get too focused on what their process is for decision making. They become too, they become too formulaic in how they go about things. And all of those things cause them to regress to the mean. All those things cause them to kind of do what's the consensus. And so his view was that you needed a portfolio and a way of operating that was uncomfortably idiosyncratic, right? Like you wanted to be pursuing the right things but you wanted to be slightly out of your comfort zone in the sense of you're departing from the consensus and not just, not just how you invest, but like how you run your organization. So I think when you're a small team, you have to be willing to be uncomfortably idiosyncratic. I think when you're a big team, that gets harder to do, right? So like, and, and by the way, like I say this out of respect to Sequoia, not out of disrespect, they've made the decision to be big. A16Z's made the decision to be big. If you're going to do that, you have to say, okay, we're going to have a centralized IT system or we have decentralized decision making, or we're going to, you know, we're going to have to codify certain things and have certain guidelines and ground rules and swim lanes. And they can make that work because of their brand and because of their scale. But like, if, if you're going to play that game, it's really important to understand what game you're playing and you're, you're playing a game where you're not going to be uncomfortably idiosyncratic. You're going to be like, okay. Every market has a set of hot deals and I need to get in the best ones. And even if it's late, even if it's a hybrid, like I've got to be the one that gets into the market leader category of finding companies. 
And, and so you, you tend to look at it as a, a funnel of companies and, you know, you got to see every one. When you're tiny, it doesn't matter if you see all the companies. It just matters that you spend, what you spend time with is really good. And so, you know, you, get, you just got to have super high standards. The other folks that have a small team that I really admire are the folks over at Thrive. You know, I think Josh Kushner gets this. He understands that, like, high standards are the key to everything when you have a small team. And you just got to, you, you're not going to be in every good deal, but the ones you're in, you got to really make them count. I think that that is just a difference of philosophy. Not one's not right or wrong. It's just, you got to decide. You, you also mentioned Roger Ehrenberg, who you admire. Um, I'm about to speak to him uh, later today and have him on the podcast. What, what do you particularly admire about him or what, what has he done uniquely well that others can learn from? There are a few things that Roger does really well. Um, one is he knows what he's looking for. And he's very clear with, about it, right? So like he says, I want software margins. I want something that data is harnessed for competitive advantage. You know, I want something like with winner take most kind of economics and effects. Uh, and if he doesn't see a project that has software margins, like if he sees DoorDash, he's like, DoorDash might be a great company, doesn't have software margins, not a Roger Ehrenberg investment, right? And so like, he is just incredibly focused and disciplined. He has a good set of rules for what he looks for. He looks for only those things. He invests in only those things. He tells the world, I'm investing in only those things. Here's what I'm looking at. Don't pitch me if you don't have those things. Uh, and he does it over and over and over again. Right. Uh, and then the other thing he has is just really high standards and he just has integrity. And I, I mean this not in a boy scout sense. I mean it more like in a to me, integrity is sort of knowing what you stand for and not deviating from that thing when it's co potentially convenient to deviate. Um, he makes the hard decision to stay who he is. Uh, and, and, you know, that's hard to do over 15 years, right? And I think he's done it about as well as anybody, right? I think he's done a fantastic job. Yeah. You want to be known for, known for something or known for nothing. And it, yeah, it's, it's hard to stay consistent when the world, uh, shifts and people get so excited about crypto and AI and other, other trends and kind of the landscape evolves. Yeah. And when I've been at my best, you know, these days I've, I've known Roger for a while. Um, but like, I'll ask myself a question like, well, what would Roger Ehrenberg do when I'm looking at a deal and it's hot and it's like, I'm chasing it and I'm like, okay, am I trying to win this to win it now? Or am I, am I doing this because this is really what my strategy is and I'm exercising integrity to my strategy. Uh, and it, it's always kind of a good thought experiment. It kind of pulls together a lot of thoughts. So I say, okay, if Roger Ehrenberg was sitting here right now with me talking this through, what would he say? And quite often that leads me to a good place. Yeah, totally. In a, in a previous podcast we, we did, we talked about sort of the epidemic of fakery, uh, you know, fake growth, fake valuations, a, a, a lot of fakery. And I, you know, one outcome from uh, this fakery that um, I talked about with Sam Lesson on the podcast he, that he proposed is this idea that, hey, uh, because so many of the unicorns turned out to be not real, he, he believes this packaging model or this factory model of venture capital where you raise a seed, so you raise a series A, so you can raise a series B, is is not going to be as as prominent as it used to be. And, and he, he thinks one implication of that is that you raise a seed round and maybe you think about getting profitable after that because it's going to be much harder to package it in the same way because people are, their firms are going to be less willing to take those kind of risks, perhaps. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, totally resonates with me. So like, I, I think, and in fact, there were deals that we missed that appeared to be big money makers because we thought they were engaged in fake growth and would engage in fake growth and probably did engage in fake growth, but still had good exits with good returns, right? Or for the time being. The, the way I look at it, Eric, is that like, like business and startups is hard, but it's not complicated. Like a, a company makes money and then it decides how to reinvest that money. And it can, it can reinvest that money by buying back shares. It can reinvest that money by building new products. It can reinvest that money by issuing dividends. It can re it can use that money to lobby the government for handouts. It can, it can use it to sue people. It can do, but, but like it, in the end, it's got to decide what to do with its profit dollars. And in a public company, it's the profit dollars that go back into the business and Warren Buffett invests in companies that get a high return on those profit dollars when they invest back in the company, right? In a startup, we don't have any profits. We have losses. 
And so we have to ask ourselves, what is a justified use of that venture capital money that's a substitute for profits? And I think that it's, it's okay to lose money if the amount of growth and the amount of category dominance that you attain justifies that amount of money lost. But what you can't do is lose a bunch of money and not have enough gains in market share, category dominance, winning the future. If you don't have enough of that to justify the amount you lost, that's fake growth. And so, like, I agree with Sam in the sense that um, some companies are going to learn that the best way to create value is to make money and to reinvest the money they make back into the business because they don't have enough upside or at least not fast enough to justify continuing to consume cash. Like some of these companies, they're going to consume so much money, they're not going to be worth their preference stack. The way I look at it is there's not an absolute answer, but there is a first principle, which is how much value are you creating relative to the cash you consume? And is that value justified? And, and in, a, in a zero interest world, people got a little bit carried away. In a, in a world that's more rational and governed by the laws of real business physics, I think that people are having to be more thoughtful about that. Yeah. But to your earlier point, it is hard when you, you know, play the right way and you see other people who are maybe not playing the right way, but the market just led them to be successful um, in not playing the right way. And so, and, and maybe they're able to make a lot of money doing it. Yeah. And it's, and it's weird. Like early on, I was like, oh man, you know, you'd get that anxiety but like, for example, our fund six, we raised in 2017 and it lasted five years. And like a lot of our peers were raising money every year or 18 months or whatever and getting ever bigger funds. But by then I'd had enough experience where I was kind of salivating. I was like, these people are paying goofy prices on stupid deals and they're going to get burned. Like you just knew it. You just knew it. And I was like, I love this strategy of just wait for swing at our pitch and just let them go by unless it's our pitch. If it takes five years, so be it. Because I, I knew, I saw the stuff that was going on around me and I was like, even the deals that work, they're paying such high prices, they're not going to make any real money. And a lot of them, it turns out, aren't going to work. And so that's going to be kind of tricky, I think. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it's like, you want to get into that mode where you know what you're doing that's different and you're like, you have this feeling of, I can't be stopped. And that, that, you know, you, that you, you're you, the, the different thing that you're doing is going to win. And I can't believe nobody's figured this out. Yeah. And then, and lastly, um, another thing Sam mentioned was this idea that different platform shifts enable startups versus incumbents differently. And, you know, internet enabled these new startups that are now worth trillions of dollars, you know, Facebook and Google mobile, uh, the, the gains largely went to incumbents, you know, it, it helped Facebook and Google went to trillions of dollars. Obviously there's Uber and Lyft and, and, you know, Snap and Airbnb or, you know, other companies that were enabled, but they're not yet at the scale of these internet ones. And he thinks AI will be similarly, largely incumbent, uh, although there will be good opportunities, but uh, it's good that you're, you're hopeful that there will be, you know, plenty of uh, startup opportunities to emerge. I, I think there will be. It, it's funny, like, um, there's this funny uh, interview with uh, David Letterman and Bill Gates from the 90s. And, and, and he's asking Bill, what could you do on the internet? And he's like, well, you could, someday you'll be able to watch videos. Someday it, he's like, it basically sounds like you can do everything on the internet someday, not as well as what you could do now on TV or the radio. And so like, we don't really, we don't know how to define all the things that are going to happen, not relative to incumbents yet. Just like we didn't in the early days of the internet. Uh, I remember the early days of the internet, people were saying, the New York Times is going to win. All the publishers are going to win because the distribution costs have gone to zero. They don't have to print newspapers. They don't have to like, you know, they're going to win because, you know, they ha they're going to have even more reach. What's this saying? Generals tend to always fight the last war. And, um, you know, I think that I think that there will be some emerging models that favor upstarts. Oh, sure. In AI. I think that's a great place to, to wrap. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. And congrats on all the success you're having. Turpentine VC is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen and Econ 102. If you liked the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store or rate us on Spotify.